We'll look at Luke chapter 15 as we continue on. Luke chapter 15. Be right back. As we continue on with, with our with our study, and we're looking at um, the father of the prodigal son as an example of dealing with maybe um, prodigal children or, or people of that nature. Um, look at Luke, Luke chapter 15. Remember the first time, the first thing we said about um, this father was that he, he stayed on the same floor. In other words, his son knew where to find him, find him when, he, when he came back to his senses and he wanted to do that. He was very consistent in that way. We also see here, look at Luke 15, verse 20. It says, And he rose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And we see the second thing is that he stayed. his father stayed the same person. He stayed the same person. Uh, when his son left, what did he do? He gave him a hug. He, you know, wished him the best. He probably told him it wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, but when he comes back, at all the time that his son had been away, and after all that his son had done to his father, the father still was compassionate. Because you remember, he said uh, to the father, hey, give me what's coming to me. What, what's my inheritance? In other words, I want what I'm getting when you die, even though you're alive. Now, that would be a wonderful thing to hear as a parent, wouldn't it? You know what? I, 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 want, I want to, basically, what is he saying? He's kind of saying, I'm treating you as if you're dead already to me. Give me my inheritance. And so off we go, and there we are. And um, so we see that, but he didn't, his father treated him the same. And you know, sometimes it's hard to do that, isn't it? If someone treats you wrong, Humanly speaking, what's the natural thing to do? Yeah. All right, that's why I'm not always like this. Um, but if someone treats you wrong, what's the natural way to react to it? Yeah, you want to treat me wrong? I'll treat you wrong. You want to, you know, wish I was dead? Fine, I'll be dead to you. Uh, but that was not what this father did. And so we, we see that some things about this father, he was a person of faith. Sometimes family trials will completely change a person. Sadly, I have seen many a times families go through difficult things and they turn their back on God and blame God and all those types of things. And they don't get better, they get bitter from it. Uh, but in this situation, uh, the father did not lose hope. Uh, for the father of the prodigal son to have seen his son at such a distance tells me something. He was probably watching for him. Right? You don't see someone at a great distance unless you're looking. And so he was probably watching for him. Um, they, you know what? As, as we see that, um, prodigal children do not need to see you abandon your faith and consistency to try to win them back. Too often I've seen people who have, have children who've gone away from church, they're like, well, I'm gonna win them back, so I'm going to go away from church, and then they'll come back. Well, that's not what they need. They need, so they ultimately will be convicted by faithfulness to God. Stay on the porch, and your, your child needs to see consistency. And then we see, uh, he was a person of compassion. He was a person of compassion. Um, he, he didn't lose hope. He didn't lose his compassion for his children. Uh, he still loved them. He still wanted what's best for them. By the way, when the son came and said, I'm no longer worthy to be your son, 
I'm worthy, I'm only, I'll be your servant. You treat your servants better. How did his father react? He put a new robe on him. He, he, had, he cleaned him up and put a new robe on him. He put his ring on him. And he killed the fatted calf and he had a big feast for him. Correct? He was welcoming him back into the family. Now here's the thing to remember. At no point did he say he was going to give him another inheritance. There are consequences to actions, correct? Because remember, the other brother was very, um, was he happy or uh, mad at the feast? Was he like, oh, my brother's home. We're having the meal. No, he was very unhappy because he's like, what's this? Basically, what did he say? I never left you and you didn't throw me a feast. But here's this guy who, here's my brother who abandons the family, takes all the money, blows it, and he comes back and now we're having a big feast for him like nothing ever happened? He was not happy. But what did his father tell him? If you remember, basically what his father said, he said, listen, this is my son who is dead but is now alive. You've still got what's coming to you. You'll get, you'll get it. Don't worry about it. It's not like he's got it. You're still going to get what's coming to you. He said, it's still okay. And so we see um, the father of the prodigal son that only saw his son, but he had compassion on him. He ran to him, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. Can you imagine the reaction of the prodigal son who had been rehearsing the speech the entire way home? Father, please forgive me. Uh, I've sinned against you and the family. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, uh, but you treat your servants better, so I'll just come back and be a servant if that's okay with you. Rehearsing that the whole way, you know, home, because remember, he said it in the, in the pig pen, at what he was going to say when he got to his father. Have you ever had a child that, like, you caught doing something and they're rehearsing what they're going to say? We have a couple of our kids that when they were younger, like, you know, you would hear them talking to themselves. Like, what are you doing? So, you know, you kind of go around the corner and then, oh, they're rehearsing the story. <laughs> they're about to come to me and talk to me and they're rehearsing what they're going to say to me. Uh, and that's kind of what I see is, is what this guy uh, was doing. Um, you know, compassion, of course, doesn't mean enabling sin. Remember? Just because you're compassionate towards the son doesn't mean he said the way he lived his life was okay. You understand when when people make a decision to not follow God or they they go away from church or whether it's a prodigal son whether it's uh, someone you know uh, compassion doesn't necessarily mean you have to completely cut them off because well I don't approve of the way they're living and I don't approve of their sins so therefore I'm not having anything to do with them. You understand compassion does not mean enabling sin. You can still lovingly come alongside someone and they can still know that you don't agree with what they're doing. But they can know you still love them. That you're still there. It's, it's a you say it's a difficult balance. It is a difficult balance because you know you don't want to. I mean, I have family members. Um, many of you know my family background. Um, I just had a, a there was a family Christmas photo that was just posted, and I just shook my head. My brother and one of my sisters and their brother, but not my brother. And, kind of get that one. And their mom, not my mom, uh, <laughs> were all in a family photo around a Christmas tree. And um, they were all giving two-handed, one-finger salutes. Kind of get what I mean? They were all, all, all four of them were giving the middle finger, both hands, to the camera with a big smile. And then underneath it, they put the caption, Merry Christmas. I just thought, what? There's a proud mothering moment right there, isn't there? Like, you know, is that what you dream of as a family photo around a Christmas tree? And then the next photo, and one hand was alcohol, and the other hand was something they were smoking, and I guarantee you it was not a legal thing you bought over the counter at a, at a grocery store. You say, well, why do you say that? Because I know my family. And I remember seeing those things, and I just messaged my brother, and I said, hey, hey, bro, I want to just wish you a uh, Merry Christmas. And he's like, you see the photos? I'm like, I saw them. 
And I said, you understand there are some things that just because you do them, they don't have to be on social media. There's some things, it's, uh, I said to him, you, re you realize it's better to be thought of fool than to post it and move on out? He goes, I thought you'd say that. And I'm like, really? I remember I, we had this conversation. I said to him, how far has living that way got you? And he goes, nowhere, I guess. I'm still, you know, battling for a job and every time I, he said, for some reason, every time I get a job and I post a photo like that, I get fired. I'm like, no, really? Every time you post a photo, like taking illegal drugs, you get fired. Duh. Because does your job have a no drug policy? Well, yeah, they do. But I make sure it's out of my system before I go to work, so that way when I get tested, I'm good. And I'm like, And he says, I know, I know, you think it's foolish. I'm like, no, I don't think it's foolish. I think it's stupid. I think you're dumb. I said, what are you going to do for your daughter? What kind of life are you raising your daughter for? And he goes, yeah, I really need to get better for her daughter. And I said, yeah. I said, but know this. And he said, what? And I said, no, I love you. And if you ever need anything, legally need anything, I'm there for you and I'll help you in any way I can. And he jokingly says, so can you send me 50 bucks? And I said, well, what are you gonna do with the 50 bucks? He goes, you know what I'm gonna do with the 50 bucks. I said, no, I love you too much to give you something to hurt yourself with. And he goes, fair enough, fair enough. I know you love me. You see, why, do you, why, why would you share that story here? <clears throat> he knows beyond any shadow of a doubt that if he ever needs anything, he can come to me, his brother. I love him, but he also knows beyond any shadow of a doubt, I do not agree with the choices he makes. I have never condoned the, 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 the drugs, the alcohol, the games, the, all those types of things. And he, he knows that as clear as day, because he'll be the first one when he says, hey, did you see those photos? And I'm like, yep. And he goes, let me guess, you don't like them. Wow, what makes you think that? To kind of get the idea as you can still stand against wrong and sin, but still love someone. And that's what this father did in his compassion. Um, and then we say this, he stayed after the same pursuits. He stayed after the same pursuits. Grief is a powerful force. Depression may cause parents to lose their desire for work, and turn to all sorts of devices. So when a child goes astray, when a child goes away, I've seen completely parents lose it, melt down, all these types of things. Sometimes in their grief, grief, they lose not just their child, but everything. The father of this prodigal did not let that happen. You see, how do you know that? Well, his fortune was not lost. His fortunes were not lost. Well, how do you know his fortunes weren't lost? Um, when his son came home, where did he come to? Home, right? That's an interesting question. Right? When his son came home, where did he come to? He came home, right? So his father still had the same house, same address, same everything. Correct? And when his son came home, uh, he put on the robes and... He, he killed the fatted calf and he put a ring on his finger and, and all these things, correct? So he still had his fortune. He, he didn't lose everything. Um, and, and we see that in this. And we'll also see this. His labor had not ceased. His labor had not ceased. What if there had been no ring, no robe, no shoes? No calf. It was not easy for the father to go on working when his son had broken his heart. I'm sure it's not easy to just continue on and keep going. But you know what? He did. He kept going to work each day. He kept, you know, when you're going through the heartbreak of a wayward child, it may be that you, you know, you go to work and you go to church. And you just keep carrying on. You say, but what if my heart's broken and the whole world is stopped? Yeah. But you don't stop living. It's 
It's kind of like when you lose a loved one. Some people just, you know, a lot, but a lot of times when you see people have been married for like 50 years or more, um, when one spouse dies, usually soon after the other one does too, right? And it's usually because this idea. Um, but I have seen time and time again, um, I remember my great grandfather, he and my great grandmother were very, very close. And uh, I respect him to this day. He, he always said, you know, when grandma got MS and she got really bad, um, he bought a hospital bed and put it in his house. Now, I, I only really got to know him a lot after she passed away, and I used to play on the bed. I say, why? Because, you know, he had those buttons that, me, 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 me. And I was only 12, and I just thought that was cool. You know, you know, me, play all kinds of things in the bed. And he would always come in as I was playing on the bed, and he would just sit there. And I didn't know my great-grandmother, but he would always sit there and tell me stories about her. And so I would be, and he'd be going on telling me stories about her. And, you know, he, I said, Grandpa, I remember one day I said, Grandpa, Grandma passed away, yeah, but you're still here. He said, yep. Yeah. I said, I remember as I got older, I said him one day, I said, uh, but a lot of times, I said, don't take this as offense, because if you call my grandpa old, it was probably a, a good time that he was going to beat you, like literally. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a big guy, and uh, we don't know where we got him in our family. You see me, you see our family, he was like six foot four and like, boom. Uh, he was not fat, but he was solid. Um, anyways, and I said, uh, why are you still here? He looked at me and he said, I never stopped. I said, what do you mean you never stopped? He said, I still went to work. I kept going. I kept riding my bike. I kept going bowling. I, I, I kept, he said, I did not stop living. And he looked at me and he said, son, whatever you do, don't stop living. Because when you stop living, it's over. And so what did this, the, you see, my grandpa was not a Christian as far as I know, but what was he saying? labor didn't cease. Don't stop living. Um, when, when that comes, remember, Proverbs 27 verse 3 says, Be thou diligent to know the st state of the flock, and look well to thy herds. Ecclesiastes verse 11, 11, chapter 11 verse 4 says, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. And say, in any situation of heartbreak, focusing on negative will always ruin the ability to do what God has called you to do. Whatever you're going through, whether it's you know a difficulty in life, whether it's a part of a child, whatever it is, focusing on the negative will always make it difficult. Remember uh, that you too have a life for which you will give account to God for. You cannot stop working and serving God simply because someone else has ceased to be faithful. You cannot justify your wrong living because someone else did something else. Eventually, you've got to take responsibility for yourself and just keep going. All right? Uh, number four. He stayed with the same passion. I cannot think me on Parents have a passionate love for their children. Even if you don't like what they're doing, you still love them, right? Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, I, I, as I've told you before, I heard a lot from my mom growing up. Son, I don't like you right now, but I still love you. And I knew what she meant. I, usually when she said that, I had just done something dumb. You say, you want to do those type of things? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Crazy, silly stuff, you know. Well, my mom would just shake her head. And uh, there's times, a lot of times she would say, I don't like you much right now, but I still love you. What was she saying? She was saying that no matter what I did, she would always love me because I was her child. And here's the particle son, he, he, the particle father, he stayed with the same passion. Oh, yeah, his, had his son hurt him? Absolutely. Had his son walked away from everything? Absolutely. But he still loved him. Did he agree with what he was doing? Absolutely not. And so as we, we look at this, for the, 
father of the prodigal, that, that love was tested by both of his sons. We miss that in the story. We only ever think that the love of the father was tested by the prodigal son. But you understand, in the story of Luke chapter 15, there are two prodigal sons. Remember when we started this last week, I said you don't have to not be present to still be prodigal? Remember? I said you could be present, you could be in church, and you could be here every service, and you could still be miles away or kilometers away in your heart. This father's love was tested by both sons. Because in some elements, the son who never left actually is further away than the son who did leave. We see a complaining son. Look at Luke chapter 15, verses 28 to verse 30. Luke chapter 15 and verse 28. And he was angry and would not go in. <laughs> so they said they're having a big party, welcoming brother home. Standing outside of the party is the brother. Angry, refusing to go into his own house. So what happens? Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Do you understand the father went after both sons? Both sons. Verse 29, And he answering said to the father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments. <laughs> Can you imagine the child standing there saying, I've never disobeyed you, Dad. Is that, that, that a reality? I mean, really think about it. I think about in your own life. Can you honestly say you could stand in front of your parents and say, Dad, I never, I never disobey, transgressed your commandments. I think he's meaning more like I've never done what he's done. Okay? And yet, thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Do you kind of get his spirit? Does he not sound a bit bitter and a bit of a particle? When I reread the story of the particle son, I cringed when I get to the part about the older brother. No sooner had the father welcomed the younger son back than the older son reacted. I would imagine the father could have been disgusted with his son's reaction. Right? If I were in his shoes, I could hear myself saying something like, What? It's not your decision. It's not your decision how I welcome him back. Now get back to work, and if you want any fat calf, you'll have to change your attitude. Right? Hey, if you want to come to this party, then change your attitude. How many times have you said that to a child? If you want to do this and change it, this morning, he said that he took a job. I don't know what's wrong with you, but you better change your attitude at some point, or it's not going to be a fun day. You say, you want to say that? Yeah, that's what you want. And here he is. But instead, the father had compassion. Look what he said. Look at verse 31. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I'm serious, is it? He said, Son, you're right. You've always been with me. Remember this. Now everything that I have is yours. Don't, don't get upset. I'm not changing that. There are some things... That and yet, compassion, it's very easy to allow negative people to drain you. When people discourage you from doing what you know is right, don't fret about it. Instead, 
strive to show the same compassion that the Father did. I mean, he couldn't. But, I mean, do you think, have you ever heard, uh, I don't know, from a movie, Every Party Has a Pooper and the Pooper is You? Older son was the party pooper. There's always one in a party, isn't there? There's always one who, like, everyone's having a good time. There's always one who says, make me have fun. Make me like this. And it's really easy to get very mad at that person, isn't it? Hey, we're all having a good time. We're all celebrating your brothers here. What is your problem? But no, he had, he had compassion on him. We see, because of that, we see the complaining son, we see a consistent father. A consistent father. The father loved both of his sons equally. If I can interpret what the other son was saying, and this thy son is come? You ever had a child say, so and so, they're your favorite. I think in Bible terms, you know what he was saying? And now that your favorite son has come home, we're having a big old party, but I never left and you've never had a party for me. But you know what? From his father's reaction, what are we seeing? Are we not seeing that the father loved both sons equally and met both sons exactly where they are? Right? Right? He met this son exactly where he was, looking out for him, watching for him. I don't know, maybe the other son knew that father was watching for the wayward son to come home. And maybe they sort of annoyed him a little bit. I mean, let's be honest. If you were the older brother and you saw your dad looking for the son, that other son every now and then, and you had never left, would that be a little bit annoying? Humanly speaking, would it be annoying? Yeah. I'd be like, hello, like, I'm still here. You know, hello, here. Why are you so worried about him over there? Yeah, he's already made it known what he wants. He doesn't want any of this. He doesn't want any part of this. So why do you care? You say, well, how do you know that? Well, it seemed to really bother him because when he came home and he refused to go in, did you read what he said about his brother? There was some bitterness there. There was a lot of bitterness there. Well, he loved the younger by praying for him and watching for him and then forgiving and restoring him. He loved the older by reserving his inheritance for him. He treated them both the same. Oh, by the way, the older son probably got more. You see what you mean? Remember, when the younger son left, he got half of all that the father had, correct? Because he got that was his inheritance. Well, between that time and the time, say, dad dies. Everything that was the half of everything that he gave and going forward was all whose? The older son, right? Do you think in all that time there wouldn't be any increase on any of this stuff that father has? There would be. Well, if he had cattle, the cattle would have more cattle, hopefully. That's how that happens. Um, if he had any investments, the investors would make interest, correct? And all these things. So in essence, the older son was rewarded for staying faithful. He was rewarded for never physically leaving. He was given what was coming to him. When the part of the son returned, the father did throw a party and demonstrated his full forgiveness with the ring, the robe, and the shoes. But... Then he give his son the other half of his inheritance that had been reserved for the older son. It's not like he said, okay, well, he's back, and from, from this time to the time I die, now I'll divide everything up and give him half and you half. He didn't do that. What did he say to the older son? He said, behold, all that I have 
is thine. I'm not changing that. I'm faithful. I'll keep my word. You don't have to worry about that. I'll take care of you. Sometimes the parent of a particle will, will obsess over that particle child to the neglect of the others. Don't neglect a faithful child in your grieving for a wayward one. You may cause the other child to feel that they don't matter that much to you. If I remember right, as I read, if you ever read the story of John Wesley, his wife, Susanna Wesley, the, <coughs> John Wesley was, I guess you'd be the founder of what would be today the Wesleyan Methodist denomination. Uh, Susanna Wesley and John Wesley had a, a large number of children. I uh, forget, like eight, nine, ten, or more children. And she had a policy that every day she would spend the same amount of time with every child. You could never accuse her of having a favorite, even though she had many different ones. Like every day she would read with every child, or she would go over the Bible and read the Bible with every child, the same amount of time. I can remember um, when my mother-in-law was still alive, there was one thing you could never you know, uh, accuse my mother-in-law of, even amongst all the in-laws, was favoritism. You couldn't. You say, why? Because if she spent $25 on everyone for Christmas, you got your $25. Not a cent more, not a cent less. And sometimes to fill in the gap, to get up to the thing, you got some weird things. You say, what do you mean? There's this little booklet that costs about 50 cents. 50 cents or a dollar, somewhere in there. And it's a dumb booklet. All right? It's called Nehemiah's Knee Slappers. First of all, if you read the book of Nehemiah, there's very little funny things in Nehemiah. But it's all these funny little antidotes and jokes that you could use in sermons. I've got at least three copies. You say, and I got them every year for either Christmas or my birthday. You say, why? Because whatever that book cost made up the difference to get me to that dollar amount. So that way, it even the number of fun was spent on everyone. So I got three copies of Nehemiah's Knee Slappers. If you want one, I'll give you one. If I still have them, I may have thrown them out. <laughs> but, you know, but equally, and, and, and remember to give the same attention to them, to them both, all right? Um, and, and can I challenge you? Love God. Love your family. Stay on the porch. Pray. Prayfully watch for their return if there's a particle. Make sure when he comes home, you're there to welcome him back to your love and to encourage him in the love of his heavenly father. But don't neglect those who are there. Invest in them too. Love them. Be part of them. Don't write anyone off. And I know, and I know in church, you know, oh yeah, we separate from those who teach false doctrine. And I get that. I get that. I get the whole idea of church discipline, and I get all that kind of stuff. But we do understand the whole point of church discipline is not to get rid of a problem. It's to correct a problem to welcome them back with open arms. Same thing with particles, same thing with all those other things. So just keep that in mind. If you ever have to deal with a particle time, if you're ever dealing with someone who's, who's gone astray, um, it, it's worth it. I can remember there was a time uh, in our, our church that we had in, in Catherine um, where it seemed like God gave us the ministry to particles. You say, what do you mean? In our church, there was a, a pastor's son who had gone astray, ran from God, was in the military, was in the Air Force, all those types of things. The uh, Lord allowed us to come into his life and, and get involved in his life, and he was back in church. Uh, there was another missionary's daughter who had gone astray, and she had moved, she had moved to, of all places to get away from everything, she moved to Catherine. And we just happened to be there. And so we would contact her still to this day. We keep in touch and make sure she's doing okay and, and all those types of things. And then there was a missionary's daughter who had gone through a, a, 
some things, and I, I won't give any detail because if I give any detail, you'll probably be able to figure out who it is. Um, and she was there, and she was struggling with some things, and she ended up getting into church and um, just doing all some things. And I'll, I'll never forget. There's one. The we're actually getting together for lunch Wednesday with one of them, and I, I'll never forget um, this one. We had a young lady who was an intern from a Bible college in the U.S. from where we went to university. And she'd come for a little while, and um, my wife asked her, so what are you doing when you graduate? She said, I don't know. I have no plans. And she said, what, what if you come back and spend about six months with us? She said, yeah, if I don't have anything better to do, I'll come back and spend six months with you. Because that was about the time when my wife was supposed to have her complete knee reconstruction that she had. And so sure enough, this young lady... Uh, rang us and said, "Can I? Is that offer still there?" We said, "Yeah, come on back." And uh, she did. And uh, when she arrived in Australia, she landed in Brisbane. There was a cyclone that closed the Darwin Airport, and it was just completely closed. So I remember I rang Pastor Lord and I said, "I told him what was going on." And he sent someone to the airport. And they picked her up. And I'll never forget. He said to me, "If there's still an airport when it reopens." We'll get her to the, to, the, to the airport, put her on a plane, and send her up to you. He said, if not, I'll see you in a few weeks. And I was like, thanks for the encouragement, bro. And he was like, I know what he meant. He was referring to Tracy and all those types of things. It's not the first time that's happened up there. Uh, sure enough, a few days later, put her on an airplane. She came back up, and uh, we were there. And that was right about the time we started the Bible study in Catherine. And uh, sure enough, about the second time we were we had that Bible study in Catherine, that young man shows up to church for the first time in ages, in ages. And uh, we were sitting there for a while, and he began to do some things. And then I remember one day he pulled me aside and he said, Pastor Joe, I'm like, yeah, mate. And he goes, how in the world did a girl like her make it through four years of university in America? Are the blokes over there just deaf, dumb, blind, and stupid? And I said, evidently, they must be. So what are you going to do about it? And he said, I think I'm going to ask Brown. So you go for it. He goes, is it okay? Because she's staying with you. I know you're not her dad, but, you know. And I'm like, go for it. I said, but I call her dad first. I at least get his permission. And he goes, well, how do I do that? I said, I'll get you in touch with him. So we did. And sure enough, they did. Now they've been married for a number of years and serving God in church and and all those types of things. They have two children now, and it's just wonderful to see what God's done in their life to bring them together and to serve in God. You say, why do you say that? Because just because someone's a part of doesn't mean you write them off. You love on them, you invest in them, you let them know you love them, you care for them. And you know what? God can bring them back. And I remember him saying to me, with all I've done, and as far away from God as I've been, God, why would he ever give me someone like that? Pointing to her. And I said, here's why. He said, why? I said, because God loves you and he wants what's best for you. And he's like, you know what? That just blows my mind. I agree with you. That just blows my mind. But you know what? Don't give up on someone just because they may have walked away or gone astray in some, some way, shape, or form. Okay? Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time together. Bless this time of uh, fellowship that we're about to have in the service this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.